We just finished a great conversation with Stacy Ross Cohen for her new book, Brand Up, The Ultimate Playbook for College and Career Success in the Digital World. And we talked about the opportunities our students have that we didn't have for building their digital footprint to focus on digital leadership. And I didn't share this in the podcast, but I did share a story with her after because I know she has a really big interest in this area. And a quote that I'm known for, and sometimes people share just the quote, but not the story behind it. And I think the story behind it really matters is this one, is that we need to make the positive so loud that the negatives are almost impossible to hear. Why did I say that? Where does that quote come from? And so the story behind that quote was, I was actually speaking at a conference in Indiana to 2000 high school students. And what happened that day was I encouraged them to get out their devices, to actually tweet and share their thinking so I could learn from them during this process. And I would speak for a little bit. And what happens is I show a video and during the video, the attention of the participants is usually on the screen and I'm checking tweets. I'm seeing what's going on so I can pick up some feedback. And the first tweet I get, I won't say it, was horrible. And it was very negative, very, um, let's just say negative. Totally anonymous, but I know it's from someone in the room because they're addressing something that I said. So I speak for a little bit. I kind of ignored it, show a video. There's another one, super inappropriate, building on the first one. So I'm very uncomfortable and I'm watching the students and all these students in front of me are looking at their phones and they all know what's going on. Now, nobody knows who did it because they're doing it anonymously, but everyone knows what's going on. And I actually looked at the teachers in the room and all they're doing is thinking, wow, these kids are really engaged because they're not, they have no idea what's going on, but they're seeing the kids really kind of into it, watching what I'm about to do. And I share this because I know people know me as an advocate of kids connecting and learning and you know building their footprints. The first thing I thought when this happened was shut it down. And then I caught myself and I'm like, am I really shutting down this opportunity because of two kids out of 2000, which schools do all the time, by the way, right? We see something really negative by one person, we shut it down for everything, right? Someone does stupid, something stupid online, shut down everything, right? Break the arm in a playground, let's get rid of playgrounds. A thing that I share with audiences all the time is that every teacher that is listening to this podcast right now is suffering from some policy that is in your organization because someone did something stupid 25 years ago and you're paying for it today. So I'm not this person, right? But I also know these kids are doing this anonymously and I got to figure out a way out of this. This is a high school level. So I just said in my talk, when I was a student or when I was a teacher and if you were my student, do you know how I measured um, success is that if I saw you outside of school, would I literally cross the street to come talk to you? Would I actually go to my way to have a conversation with you? If I did that, that showed me something. And I prayed that I would become that teacher and hopefully you can be that for each other today. So this kid, and I still connect with him, uh, he tweeted from the account, Mr. Sauce. And he said, I love the way you share your message. It's very entertaining and informative. And he complimented me. And I stopped everything. I said, where is Mr. Sauce? So this kid stands up way in the back. His name is Dita. And I, I said, what is your name, sir? He said, Dita. I said, Dita, you have no idea the impact you had on me. And he didn't just have an impact on me. He had an impact on all these other students who start bombarding this hashtag with kind things. And... What was interesting is that the hashtag was so overwhelmed with kind comments and very positive, uplifting things because it is contagious, right? They saw that I acknowledged this and they wanted to be a part of something. And what's fascinating, the, the educators at the end of the day, they looked at the hashtag, they're like, those kids love you, like not everybody, not everybody loved me, right? But the first two kids, wh whoever they were, never tweeted from those accounts again which I thought was really fascinating. But there was something really powerful that day. And the quote, we need to make the positive so loud that the negatives are almost impossible here, isn't about pretending everything is good in the world. It's not about addressing issues. It's actually being the example of a way to move forward, to actually be um, something really positive that people want to catch on to. And I learned that lesson from a student. And I want to share that with you today because... 
I think it really ties into this podcast for Stacy's book. Uh, she wrote this with my friend Jason Schaefer, who's in Florida. And I saw the effects of his classroom. I've had him on the podcast. So you can check that podcast out as well. But I know you're going to love the podcast. You're going to learn a lot, whether you're um, an educator, parent, or both. I know it's going to have an impact. So welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Crow. So welcome to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed today to have Stacey Ross Cohn on the podcast. She has a brand new book out with someone who also has been on the podcast, Jason Schaefer, who I've known uh, for a long time. And Jason speaks so highly of you. Uh, and we also have a mutual connection with Lainey Rowell. And Lainey, uh, Lainey, if you're listening, and I, you, listen, I know Lainey is listening. Uh, so I'm going to give Lainey a little shout out. <laughs> you didn't know I had that, did you, Stacey, right? Nope. No, I did not. That was, <laughs> she will love it. She will. And she, it hurt. do you know who will love it? Her kids will love it. Their kids yes. love when I play the air horn. So uh, uh, Stacey has a new book out uh, called Brand Up, The Ultimate Playbook for College and Career Success in the Digital World. And Stacey, you come from the, the world of marketing, but you have this beautiful connection with education. I We spent about a half hour talking before we even got on this. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about the stuff that you're working on, the stuff that you're sharing, because it's so aligned with my work. So Stacy, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell everyone who you are, what you do today, it's a, a great place to start. Sure, absolutely. And, and George, thank you for having me on right, today. Sure. I'm so excited to finally meet you. I've been hearing about you from, you know, <laughs> so many people, o only rave reviews, of course. So my name is Stacy Ross Cohen. I, um, I run a PR marketing agency called Co Communications. And we're located in New York, have a satellite office also in Connecticut. And I guess you could say I was born into a very entrepreneurial family. And I started my first business when I was 14. And as a result, in uh, at Co Communications, we help build brands, uh, work with a lot of real estate, healthcare, education, and, and a lot of startups. And uh, have a little side gig going on as, as you know, I got into personal branding a couple of years ago. And interestingly enough, after a five plus year journey, ended up, uh, you know, uh, dedicating, uh, focusing the book on, on the teen years where mm -hmm. developing the personal branding muscle is not a luxury. It has truly become a requirement. Yeah. And that, that's something that, you know, we've really been focused on, uh, for years. And one of the things that I really, uh, we were talking about this before, there is this still kind of, you know, me, and I think it's a little bit of an outdated belief that all of your students, you know, if they want to go on to the next phase of their lives, like their grades are so necessary to this. But one of the arguments that I have given to groups all the time, let, let's say you have uh, a valedictorian of your class, the top academic student. And then they're posting horrible stuff online. All of a sudden, the valedictorian stuff doesn't matter anymore. And it doesn't actually, I know this sounds weird. It doesn't actually say anything negative. Like, of course, we all did bad things, right? And this is yeah. one thing I say to people all the time. If your worst 10 minutes were online, not one of you, including myself, would have a job. Like, and that's sometimes what it is with a kid. And so we, we focus so much on that. But then people don't pay attention to, you know, school. More and more colleges are Googling kids before. I wouldn't go I wouldn't have, you know, anyone work for me unless I Google them, go through, you know, what their reviews are and saying like that. And so I, I see that's a huge, you know, focus point um, that needs to be tapped into in education. And so, like, what what is kind of your main philosophy on that? And what's some of the work that you've been doing to kind of help, you know, teens? Uh, in that age range, make sure that we're setting them up for success, you know, with what they're doing online. First of all, very spot on. This is a crazy statistic, but if you think about it, in, in one internet minute, there are 6 million Google searches. Oh. So George, someone's Googling you, they're Googling me, <laughs> they're, right. they're, they're looking. And the right. majority of, of admission officers 
and job recruiters are looking at applicants online. There's no two ways about it. So what, what that means is that kids need to have a strong online presence. Mm -hmm. They need to, you know, we all have digital footprints and they need to make sure that their digital footprint is stellar. But in, but, but in addition to that, it's, we all know, first of all, a lot of the colleges now are test optional. And as you said, with, with the grades, like if there are, let's just say there's two students right. and they have the same GPAs, they have the same test scores and the admissions counselor, which by the way, a typical admission officer spends about 10 minutes right. on each application. Who is she going to choose? Right. So it's probably going to be the kid that during the pandemic, maybe they started a tutoring business. So it's really critical to, to it's a very competitive cluttered world. It's important to stand out. Kids need to, when they're in high school, figure out what their superpower is. What is it about them that, that makes them unique and stand out and be able to convey that in order to get to the top of the admission officer's pile. And this is a skill that will guide them through life. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, it's like their next step is, you know, once they're in college is, is getting that, that um, first great dream job. Right. And, and, and again, this is just an important skill. I found that there was a void in high school and um, I have two girls when they're, they're both 20 when they were in high school, a very competitive high school district, so many of the kids had 4.2 GPAs. And that's when I had the epiphany and I was like, wow, you really need to market yourself. You've really got to stand out at an early age. Well, they, so the, so the interesting thing is some people think what you're saying is in theory, like it's not actually happening. This isn't a reality. People don't do this. So in, I think it was 2009, when I was a principal, we would have, for example, 500 applications for a grade one position, right? Yes. And so I've talked about this a million times. I would actually go through every resume, right? And as soon as I saw something I didn't like, they're gone, right? Something that, you know, that, hey, this is not a fit, whatever. And so I would whittle that pile down to 10. And what I would do with the 10 is I would Google each of those candidates, knowing I'm only going to interview four of them, right? And so I had basically three piles, positive, negative, neutral, right? So if you're negative, the pile was located in the garbage. You're, you're out, right? And part of it is the idea that you're an amazing teacher, but something super inappropriate. And then a parent's going to Google you as soon as I hire you. And now it's going to look like I haven't done my job and things like this. And we, I've had this conversation several times when people say, Hey, uh, my views don't align with my school district. I'm like, yeah, they do. Like as much as you pretend they don't, you're going to be associated with that organization. So the neutral pile, is, you know, I can't find really anything, right? And I would do everything. Like I, if your name was like John Smith, I would go John Smith. I could see in your resume where you went to school and I could find you somehow, right? Nothing good, but you know, nothing bad. And then the positive ones, those are the ones getting the interview, right? So I wouldn't just say, cause I'm sure this is a reality that you've seen this in different areas of, you know, work and life. Someone can have a really good footprint, but then when you meet them, it's, it's like, hey, they know how to brand themselves and they know how to put content out, but they don't actually live the values they see. So we still call references and things like that too. So even in 2009, this was a process. And that is like, that is kind of leveraging it to, you know, who's representing my school, who's doing this too. And I just don't think people think it's a reality, but I've been doing this for a long, long time. And like, do you, do you see this in, in the world of work too? Like people are. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. But before we make any new hires, it's, uh, and, and look, someone could look great on paper and uh, have face-to-face -face interviews. We do a Google search. We find out uh, something negative online. And then unfortunately they don't get the position. So, 
I love, I love what you just shared. Google has become the new resume. And oh, it's totally. as simple as that. Google has become the new resume. And so you cannot leave your digital footprint to chance. And it's, you know, and, and also a lot of, of guidance counselors, and you know this better than I, I get the sense, and again, I'm not in the educational world per se, but I still think that a lot of them are telling kids, stay off of social media. Totally. Whereas, whereas I'm telling them, no, put yourself out there, but put yourself out there in, in the right way. Yeah. And that, that, that's been, that's been my argument with this too. And, and I, like, I, I have three kids. I'm very cognizant of, you know, how much they use technology. It's, you know, and someone says, well, like my kids are on this all the time and they're zombies and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, parents, like you got a parent, right? So it, anything too much of is bad. And so of course, but part of that guidance, we don't just let kids do whatever they want and right figure out a way, but how do we guide them? So I've kind of always been in the things like, Hey, this is a reality and how do we leverage it? And one of the, one of the things like, let's just say I've, and I've had this conversation, let's just say you apply for a job and the person doesn't Google you, like just make the assumption they'll never Google you. Right? So even we have these students who are making their own websites, their own portfolios, posting online on the very front of their resume, on a very traditional paper resume that the company is still asking for, it says for full portfolio, check out georgecarlos.ca. So you're saying, here I am, like go ahead and look at me so that it actually works in my favor to even the person that doesn't Google you because now you get to see all of their stuff, you know, all, all of those connections. And so I, I really love that you're saying like, basically, and that's the, that's, that was the neutral pile. Like, oh, this is never yeah. gonna haunt me. Yes. But do you, do you even like one of the, one of the things and I'm curious your thoughts on this. I don't think there is a neutral pile. And the reason is because anyone listening to this podcast right now, whether I post it or not, or like whether I tweet about it or do anything, if I post online, they can talk about you. They can talk about me. And so there's always things out there about everybody. Right. And now I, I would say to people, you have a footprint. It's just, are you making it or is someone else doing that for you? Yes. Thank you. Because we all have to be our own brand manager. We've, we've got to take control. We've got to take ownership. And and I have to tell you, I appreciate what you said with the, with the resume, with the URL, my, my business partner at, um, you know, PR marketing agency a couple of years ago, she has two young boys and she was really struggling with a name for her first. And I said, Jess, I said, whatever you do before you make the final decision, I said, just make sure that the URL is available because I have to tell you, it's, I'm so glad, I guess, because I'm a marketing person. I'm so glad for instance, that I, I purchased my URL in the early days um, and it was just Stacy Cohen, but then it's interesting for my own branding. Now I'm Stacy Ross Cohen, and I have both URLs because if you Google Stacy Cohen, so many come up. So that's mm -hmm. why from here on in, I'm going as Stacy Ross Cohen. But another great thing, I love what you said about parenting, setting boundaries. I speak to so many teens lately, and you know what they tell me, George? They're like, well, you should tell this to my mom or you should tell this to my dad. <laughs> so right parents way. need to be good role models. Have you ever heard the term sharenting? No, no, but I'm, okay, I'm so this is, okay, I don't know. So, so this, you'll really understand this. I didn't have this raising, you know, raising uh, my kids. As a matter of fact, even though they're in their 20s, they say to me, we are so lucky we did not grow up in today's right. world in social media, which I find fascinating. But Moms today start their kids' digital footprint, even with a sonogram. Yeah, oh, there's totally. actually totally there's actually, yeah. right, and there's actually a sharenting expert. She's in your neck of the woods. She's in Florida. She's an attorney, and I interviewed mm -hmm. with her. She was fascinating, and it changed my mindset because a lot of times, like I'll just take family pictures, just post them. Uh, after speaking to her, and I and I hope that everybody else will heed this. I will never post a picture of my girls 
without asking them permission first. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's it's their digital footprint. It's not ours. Yeah, that you know, and that's a so I wrote a, a blog post uh, about this years ago, and I, like we, you know, I post my kids online, and they want to be honest with you, they want to now. 10 years from now, they might say, dad, why did you post that? I'm like, well, I, I asked you, right? And my thing is, some people say, well, kid's not old enough to understand that. And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm, I'm making decisions based on my amount of knowledge and I, what I think is best for my kids. Just like many parents don't ask their kids when they're five years old, where would you like to go to school? They make a parenting de decision, right? And so one of the things that I focus on is these schools, what they do is they do all this stuff with parents uh, and, and caregivers to get permission to post kids. And then they, it's just a free for all. They just post. I said, the, the thing that you, the person you always have to ask is still the kid, even if yes. you got the, the, the consent of the parent, because part of it is having the kid be a part of the conversation but also teaching the kid before you post, ask, right? Because it's yes. very easy. We just yes. start filming yes. someone and just doing this and like, well, I can do whatever I want and blah, blah, blah. And so there has to be that that part of it too. So I, I love that. And I, I'm very, I think as a parent, one of the things I'm very cognizant of is I'm trying to actually help my kids get a head start on the footprint stuff and being like, so there's no poopy diaper pictures, if that makes sense. Right. Yes. And I think I'd be embarrassed by anything, but I'm very, you know, I'm very thoughtful of kind of like, I don't want to put them in a place where it would be me getting a cheap laugh as an adult at the expense of my kids. If exactly, that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. Because everything we post is permanent and discoverable and a lot of teens. And, and I understand I, I was that teen, you know, you, 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 you think like you could do anything which is which is a great part of being a team but i think the the earlier that we can have them understand the consequences of of what they pose later in life you know we just we just got to get them earlier and, and i also think like look at the surgeon general's report that just came out two or three weeks ago how social media is posing uh you know some some serious harm on, on um, adolescents' mental health. So it's mm -hmm. like, I, I feel that what, what you and I and, and Jason and, and others believe, it's like, I believe this needs to be in the curriculum of, of every high school across the nation. That's like, that's my aim for, for, for the book and, you know, what I'm doing right now. Yeah, and that, that you know, one of the things that, I've advocated for, and, you know, um, I already have these conversations with my oldest daughter, Clea, and she's all of six years old, right? Is that <laughs> what, what you're seeing, what you're seeing online is, is the highlight reels. So when your dad watches ESPN sports center, that's what social media is. It's the best of. And so people, you know, but, but you're, they're not posting the whole, like when I watch the whole game, you see all the boring stuff all the stuff people don't care about. That's, that's actually real. That, so, I love that analogy that I, yeah. I may steal that from you. It's you, so go, true. Go the high... <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that is, that is true. Right. Because I think part of it too, is people are comparing themselves to ESPN sports center, not the entire game. And so oh. that's where we're causing that depression. So it is, there, there is this kind of argument. Well, you know, when kids go on social media, they always see just the highlight and it messes their mind up. And so my thing is I can't control what other people post, but what I can control is my perception of it and how I look at these things and how I understand them. And that's what I want to teach my kids. Cause I can't stop people from posting their best of and their highlights and all those other things, but I can't help my kid understand that process. Right. And I think that's why, and I wanted to ask you, and I know, um, this, and I'm going to, the link down below is to the book, uh, brand up the ultimate playbook for college and career success in the digital world. So before you tell me what the book's about, what inspired you to write it in the first place? And I think we kind of, kind of got an idea of it, but if I was to ask you just what inspired you, 
why did you start delving into this? What was what what started this off for you? It was it was really seeing my girls in a very competitive high school, as I said, like 4.2 GPAs that you had like it was it was essential to market yourself to stand out. There's just so it was so competitive, high anxiety. And um, and then at the time I was writing for Huffington Post. And, um, and there were also all these reports that were coming out that the majority of admission officers were looking at kids' social media. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in 20, I think it was 2017, Harvard 10, where there were 10 kids that, uh, that well, they got accepted into Harvard. Now, believe it or not, Harvard's acceptance rate has dipped. At the mm -hmm. time, it was like 5.6%. It's now 3.2%. Mm -hmm. These brilliant 10 kids got into Harvard. They formed a separate Facebook group, racist remarks, uh, and and uh, administration got a hold of it, and all of their admissions were revoked. Mm. So what that tells us, George, is that like smart kids are not always smart right. on social media. So when I wrote the first Huffington Post blog, I... Um, I was curious, are there any schools that are teaching digital leadership? Found one school in North Broward, Florida, uh, our, our mutual friend, Jason yeah. Schaefer, who created the curriculum and also taught it, did not interview him, but just included it in my article. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed. This class was made mandatory for ninth graders. Every kid had to take this class. After the article ran, Jason got in contact with me, as did this um, you know, my other co-author, Alan Katzman, and we all became fast friends. Hmm. And I was visiting Florida on vacation and Jason was like, Stacy, could you please sit in my classroom? Like, of course, sat in his classroom. I was blown away. Like how these 14 year olds, they were telling their narrative and, and a 14 year old typically does not understand what their superpower is. But Jason was helping them tell their story in such a, a powerful, creative way. Went back to New York and I wrote about my experience in the classroom and that article went viral. Wow. And after it did, I knew that I had something. And after a five-year journey, the book zig not, not quite, mm -hmm. but the book zig zigged and zagged a bit. The first book was to parents. Um, but at the same time, Jason and I and Alan were working on a companion book, and that's where we landed. And the book came out about three months ago. Yeah, and if you want to check it out, it's actually in the links down below, so make sure you check it out. And one of the things I actually was witness to, and I'm curious, if, I, like, I don't know if this happened, but I actually wrote about Jason, so I don't know if you found him through my blog or some other way that, like, I, that would be curious. I, you know what? I, I wonder. I think I got right to the, the school website, oh, wow. if I remember correctly. Well, so here's here's something I've posed to people about this, and this is why, really, Jason's class stuck out to me and why he's such a valuable contributor to this book. So I, I'll say to, and I'll say this to educators all the time. Let's say your dream job is up tomorrow like the job you always wanted is available but you have to have your resume in by like 9 a.m right so some people have not touched a resume for 10 15 20 years right what are they going to do they're going to find their latest resume the the last one they did they're going to update it and if it gets in by 8 59 a.m it'll be there like it's going to be there right Okay, so so we know that's that's gonna be ready to go, but the thing is, there's not really much you can do overnight for your footprint, like that that takes time. And so yes. they weren't waiting till the senior year, the grade twelve year, for them to actually work with the students. They're actually helping them build that footprint throughout because they know it's something that takes time, and it has to have a consistency. And that's like that's something you and I agree with. You know, is that importance of actually building this into school curriculums because you can't say, well, grades are so important that colleges are looking at this, but then uh, we don't have to worry about the digital. That's their problem, right? When they can actually negate one another. And I think that's a really important concept. One of the things you talked about um, when we were kind of prepping for this podcast was 
and you've kind of mentioned it, the importance of having kids have the opportunity to kind of stick out and share their own story. And you actually shared something about your, you're a twin. And yes. that's part of that. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And, yeah, and yeah. Oh, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, it's interesting because I, as you know, I did a TEDx talk and I wove my whole story about being a twin into personal branding because there is no doubt that it shaped my quest um, to to work on my own personal brand, but also to to help others. This, if you think about it, like growing up as a twin has its challenges. You know, constant comparisons. Stacy, you know, like why do you weigh more than your twin? Mm. What you know? Why does she get better grades than you? And I remember having one aunt that I don't even think that she knew our names. We were just like known as the twins. Yeah. And of course, you know, we shared a room, we had twin beds until we were 16. So I always wanted to be unique and memorable. And that's what personal branding is, is about. And really the biggest compliment that someone could give me growing up was like, Stacy, you are so unique. Mm-hmm. So again, I have, and I feel like it's a gift. Like I know how to package things. It doesn't matter if it's a product. It doesn't matter if it's a service or a person. I want to crystallize the, um, like their uniqueness. Like what, because there's a misconception, right? Personal branding, a lot of people think it's like narcissistic. It's like me, me, me. But when it's not, it's really like, what is the value of you to others? What can you contribute to the, the college campus? And so it's, finding again what your value is and why should someone choose you why should you land on the top of an admission officer's pile and the same flows through to if you're looking for an internship or trying to get a scholarship or or a job or even to that matter online dating right i've had some single friends like ask me for their help yeah yeah that that that's a that, that's a really important aspect of this too, because I think um, sometimes there is this like social media is fake and you know, you're a certain way when you're offline compared to online. And there, there is some truth to that for myself. And the way that I explain it is, for example, do I swear? Of course I swear. I swear terribly, right? Do I swear in social media? No. And the way, the way I treat it is, it'd be like me teaching in a classroom. Like I wouldn't swear in front of students. So why would I swear in social media? And it's, it's not about being fake. It's understanding the context, the context yes. of where you are, yes. um, who you're connecting with, and you don't want to lose opportunities before this too. So that's one thing that I try to explain to people. It's there. Yeah. So of course, some people are fake. They're, per, they're portraying something that they really are not, but understanding that people understanding context doesn't mean they're fake, right? Like I share a lot of my ups and downs. I don't know how much you Googled me before. I know we have mutual connections, but like I have struggled with my weight for years and years and I've lost like 120 pounds over the last year. And I've shared the struggles I had with that, what I was trying, what I was doing. And a lot of people have appreciated that I shared that journey, not just when I found success, but when I was struggling with failure and they connected with me in a different way. And I would have those same conversations with my students and that's what makes us real and relatable. And I think that's a really important aspect. And one of the things that you said, and I love this, you said, here's like a four word quote and I wrote it down as soon as you said, um, add value, not clutter. What do you mean by that? And I love, I, I take a, I have a perception of what that means. What's your, what, what do you mean by that when you share that? Yes, and I will answer that in a second, but I just want to tell you that I personal branding is about being authentic and real, and I love vulnerability. I think we can show the weaker parts of, of ourselves. It, it makes us makes us all real, and we all have our own struggles. So thank you for sharing that. So add value, not clutter. That is that is definitely my mantra. It, it there is so much clutter out there. And people just turn off to it. Yeah. And a lot of people will, will post, for example, on social media just to make sure that they get their one post in a day. But no, I'd rather see someone post valuable content 
that their audience is going to relate to. So we've all heard the term return on investment, but I like to use the term return on engagement, right? Because what you want at the end of the day is you want people to, to see your content. You want to make it real. You want to make it relatable and you, and you want to strike up a conversation. That's what social media is. It's a two way exchange. And I think when, I think when people are just adding posts just to, just to feed the, you know, the content beast, it's just, it's worthless. It's, it's a waste of time because it's like, you've got to make every word count, right? You've got to make every word count. And you have to like, even think about like all of your different touch points. I even tell kids, by the way, George, that like even your email signature is it's mm -hmm. priceless real estate. As you're sending it out to admission officers or alumni, put something there about yourself. Maybe, you know, put in a, a link to a video or, or maybe create a tagline for yourself. So, so again, I, I, it's, it's like, I guess also as, as a news junkie, because I'm in the media, but I've also been in the media. Uh, wait, I'm in the media, but I also right. in the media. I also say to people, you've got to be your own news channel. Yeah. And so I look at content with for news value from like zero to 10. So everything we put out there, put it through the who cares test. Right. You know, so I was actually looking this up because I wanted it. I wanted, you know, one thing you said, you're going to, you're going to probably get a kick out of this. So I would get these resumes and they would like have their contact information, but they would be like, uh, Lincoln Park Lover eighty two at aol dot com. Yes. Like, oh my God. like update your email address. Right? Yes, thank it, you. It was, it like, oh actually, my God. I actually have that in my book. Like you know, like like yes, professional. Like every <laughs> single touch point. That's a great point. You need a professional email address, and don't worry about your old one. You could direct it to your <laughs> new one. Thank you. So, so I was looking this up when you were talking because you made me and I, I, I wrote. I actually did a um, a video on this. It's I'm pretty sure it's a Michael Keaton movie who's like most known for Batman movies. Um, I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll write down the movie in the description. So it's an old movie, and he basically he's i think he, like he's gonna die i can't remember the movie well i just kind of remember the premise and he actually records all these uh vhs tapes for his kids after he dies and it's like lessons to his kids that even after he's gone that he can share with them and so i talked about this when i actually look at what i post on social media it is a journal i'm leaving for my kids so i i know that sounds weird my biggest concern isn't like going viral and all this other stuff. It's like, what lessons and what things will my kids see? Because you think about, like I have uh, my my father, very few pictures when he was young because like there wasn't really cameras, right? And a lot of things, like I mentioned to you, we moved to Florida and I actually, you're gonna love this. I, I gotta tell you the story, Stacey, you're gonna love this. So when we moved here, my, my daughter was uh, five, my, Younger daughter was two and uh, our son was born after the fact. So for all of my kids, I started email accounts for them before they were even born. And I actually wrote a long email to my kids about why we moved and what was the purpose of this. But they won't have access to these email accounts until they're at least 18 years old because I don't really understand why my dad moved to Canada because we just never had the conversation. So I always look at it as a journal and I feel if I do it that way, I'll always be fine and I'll always build an audience. But if worst case scenario, I just leave good lessons for my kids. I, I'm good with that. And I'm curious your thoughts about that process. I, first of all, I love it. I like that. That's so, first of all, it's so thoughtful and, and considerate and, you know, because you understand, you know, your responsibility as, as a parent mm -hmm. to help your children at such a young age in this, uh, you know, dizzying uh, digital landscape. 
what what a beau that is just such a beautiful gift and i i would probably also encourage you to see if you could get their urls also, but i'm already on it trust me i'm already I, I on figured, it yeah. i figured so it's already been taken care of yeah i figured so much uh, you yeah. know that that is thank you for sharing that with me george because that i've never heard that before that mm. is that is truly like the sweetest story <laughs> I, love it. Well, I was telling you i wasn't telling you for that but yeah I guess no, no 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 but 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 yeah. it's it's just you know and, and here's the thing i just it's we all need to be all of us it's but mm. it's starting in the teen years you need to yeah. be deliberate and intentional that's really what it comes down to yeah. you 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 need to be you need to be thoughtful yeah and that that is that is at the end of the day and i, I think the leverage point that's very different because a lot of people talk about this like hey you might get googled you know somebody might look for you when you're applying for college the thing that i've always tried to instill in my kids is that when you start doing this stuff it's not you applying for opportunities. If you do it well, the opportunities will find you because people will see your stuff and go, that's someone I want, yeah. right? That's someone yeah. I want in the space. And it actually, they'll be reaching out to you. And that's one of the great leverages that our kids have that honestly, I did not have at the same age. And to pretend it doesn't exist is not really helpful to our kids, right? The world has changed. And are we actually embracing that change and leading our kids to this? So I, I loved our conversation and I know this book is going to be super helpful, not only to uh, teens and parents, but educators. So check out Brand Up, the ultimate playbook for college and career success in the digital world. Stacey, I don't think this is going to be your last time on the podcast, So, but thank you for taking the time to be on here today. And George, thank you for having me. You, you are such a rock star. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Stacey. And thanks everyone for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.